Welcome to our uh, public meeting tonight on the Cockra Bridge um, project. Um, we're going to, I'm going to introduce you to our city officials. My name is Chris Millette, by the way, I'm the communications director here. I'm going to introduce you to our city officials and our uh, uh, design team who are here. And uh, one, one, uh, one uh, of uh, the representatives from that design team will then show a presentation that will last about 15 minutes. Uh, it's going to show you details about the project and these three suggested bridges. After which we're going to have comments, public comment in person and also uh, online through uh, our Zoom channel and Facebook. I'll be moderating those. So we'll start with the in-person comments. We'll, after the presentation, we'll ask everybody to line up on my left side, uh, come to the podium one at a time, name and address, uh, two minutes for your comments. Um, I'll give you a uh, alert at one, one and a half, and you'll hear a, you'll hear a bell at two. Um, we're looking for comments uh, on the presentation. We're looking for comments on the project. We will answer questions after all the comments. We'll keep note of all of any questions that come up about the presentation. We'd like to keep the, the questions that you have to the presentation and to the three, uh, the three bridge proposals that you see here. Uh, and our team will be here afterwards to answer any other questions. Uh, don't forget that we have surveys, uh, printed surveys here. Uh, and for our online group, um, I can email you a survey so you can uh, put it in writing uh, which of the proposals you like the best. Okay. In the house today, we have Chuck Zisk, our public works director. We have AJ Anselik, our assistant public works director. Leanne Parmenter, traffic engineer. Jason, Jason Sayers, bureau chief of engineering. And from Trans Systems, which is our, uh, uh, our partner in this, we have Brian Krull, who will be doing the presentation in a moment. Joe Ruskevich, did I get it right? Close, Close enough. <laughs> Michael Cuddy is right here. Jeffrey Holmes is right here. And Sydney Kakai is in the back. All right. All right, we're ready to go. We're looking for, uh, we're looking, you know, to share uh, uh, a lot of good information about this project and to hear from you. Brian, are you ready? Yes, sir. Thank you, Chris. And again, my name is Brian Kroll. Welcome and uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, we appreciate you coming. We got some pretty exciting things to show you too. Uh, we're gonna go through that here. I have a handful of slides, so 15, 20 minutes. Um, and then like Chris said, we'll have the uh, comment period. Again, don't forget, we do have sign-in sheets and comment forms. So just wanted to uh, make sure everybody signs in. This way we can get your name on the list uh, so you can get project updates. Okay, let me, Chris did a, good, a great job of introducing the project team. But this is really who's involved in the project. We got the city of Erie, uh, the Erie MPO. Erie Western uh, PA Port Authority. I'll be talking about them in just a little bit uh, about some right-of-way and, and property ownership. PennDOT District 1, they'll be doing some structural reviews for us. And again, as Chris mentioned, uh, we're Trans Systems. We're an engineering uh, consulting firm. We, do, we specialize in transportation. Now, our job is to do the engineering. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the plans together, specifications, the cost estimate, and then at that point, we hand it off to a contractor. Okay, so we are the engineering firm. Um, we have a couple of subconsultants as well uh, on our team, a and consultants. Uh, they're gonna be handling some of the geotech engineering, that's below ground work uh, for the bridges. And then Montelow Basin engineers, uh, taking care of some of the survey and right away. And yes, our firm is located in Pittsburgh. And yes, it was 72 degrees there today, so <laughs> it's a little chilly here at Erie. Uh, I, I think everybody knows, I don't, I don't need to spend too much time with the location maps. I think everybody knows uh, the project we're talking about, uh, but uh, right there in the red is our uh, proposed Cockwa Bridge. And this just kind of zooms in to the area. The green is the outline. We know the bridge is no longer there, but uh, that's sort of looking down, plan view, uh, location map of the area. Ravine Drive uh, is right in the middle. 
Okay, let's talk about some Kakwa uh, facts and some history, okay? So, and, and a lot of you know this stuff, but uh, I think it's good context as we move to the bridge alternatives. Um, so the Kakwa Bridge that was built in 1920, right back in the, uh, 1920, to carry uh, vehicular and pedestrian traffic over Kakwa, uh, across Kakwa over Ravine. And uh, what's important here is Ravine Drive. That serves as the only route to the Ferncliff residence, uh, as well as the Erie Yacht Club. Uh, the former bridge, as you see from the pictures there, it was a uh, single span, reinforced concrete, uh, close span drill arch. So it was about 26 foot span length, right? Span length this way, and about uh, uh, 57 feet um, arch barrel length, okay? And that would be uh, that way on Ravine. So what happened? Kakwa Bridge was demolished by the city back in October 2021 because of its uh, advanced deteriorating conditions. And you can see some of the pictures here too, right? You know, you can, you can see what kind of shape this bridge is in. Uh, and just sort of for the, the safety of the public, it was demolished primarily for safety concerns. So after that, uh, based on a neighborhood survey performed by the city, 55% of residents requested a vehicular bridge with pedestrian-friendly enhanced sidewalks uh, for pedestrians. 38% requested uh, a pedestrian-only bridge, uh, and 7% requested no bridge. So 55% was the majority um, that requested the vehicular bridge, and that's what we're gonna show you here uh, today. So I'm going to touch on just a few of our scope tasks. That's some of the work that we need to do to get to that end product I was telling you about, uh, the, the final plan set to get it out to construction. So one of the first things we, we do actually in any project is we, we get a good survey of uh, aerial, some topo survey, and our subconsultant performed that back in the fall of 2022. They also did some property uh, and deed research as well as uh, right-of-way coordination. So this is where the Airy Port comes in because they own pretty much all this uh, land adjacent to Ravine. They also own Ravine Drive. So the important part here is that mostly, if not all, the property will have to be taken from uh, the Airy Port, meaning adjacent properties will not be impacted. So moving on, geotechnical. That was another one of our subs, A&A &A consultants. Um, they're doing the geotechnical engineering. Uh, what is that, GER? That's a geotechnical engineering report. And there may be some acronyms on here, so that's just some engineer speak, but I'll try to make sure I abbreviate those for you. Um, so basically, they're looking at the ground, <clears throat> looking at the foundations, what the bridge can uh, go on, and they're gonna to have to go out there and do some geotechnical borings, you know, the drill rigs that you see. Uh, they'll be out there at some point once we uh, select a preferred uh, alternative. Okay, just a couple of other tasks to go through here. Uh, utilities, right? So we did a PA1 call, and that was completed also in the fall of uh, 2022. We do know there's an existing storm sewer underneath Ravine, uh, pretty deep but we're, we're investigating that to make sure there's, there's no impacts. If so, uh, you know, a potential relocation or some adjustments will need to be made. And then we did do extensive coordination with the Erie Yacht Club. They're proposing a water line up Ravine. Uh, so we wanna make sure we coordinate with them so that water line doesn't need moved again. Um, so we did have some coordination with them. We had a scoping field view. That's just a meeting out in the field with all the officials. Uh, PennDOT was there, uh, some other structural folks, a uh, handful of other folks. That's actually the meeting minutes you see there. So we had a scoping field view, making sure everybody's on the same page and we know what our, our scope of work tasks are. And then we get into really the, the nitty gritty, the good stuff that we're gonna be doing <clears throat> on the design. That's the alternatives that we're gonna go through today three alternatives. Roadway plans, we have to put together a 30, 60, 90 package. We'll show you our 30% um, submission for Ravine. We're gonna get into bridge design. 
once we select an alternative. And then ENS plan, that's erosion and sediment uh, control. And basically, we look at runoff and, and try to eliminate some of the silt and um, things of that nature. Now, a very important uh, topic, and I wanted to bring this up, it's part of our scope, it's traffic control. So we know this is very important because, as I mentioned, Ravine is, is the main, main thoroughfare. It's, it's really the only way that you can get to the Ferncliff housing and the Erie Yacht Club. So we know traffic control is going to be uh, very important. We also need to account for emergency uh, vehicles, fire, and also, you know, temporary. Uh, how are we going to get pedestrian bicycles um, in and around that particular area? Now, a lot, a lot of this traffic control is going to depend on which bridge we select. Now, some of the bridges where we have some uh, precast elements uh, versus cast in place, there's a, there's a duration difference there. So it's really going to depend on what structure is selected before we can get into the type of measures we need for traffic control. And that's what I mentioned up here. Further details will be forthcoming at the next public meeting. Uh, there will be another public meeting once we select the bridge. At that meeting, we'll get into some of the traffic control, some of the other details of the bridge. Um, but uh, we just want you to know that it is an important part uh, of our scope of work, the traffic control. And public outreach, that's why we're here tonight. Okay, we're here to uh, listen to you. You're gonna have some time to provide comment. And again, we're gonna stick around after, answer any questions. Uh, just some things, uh, obviously the meeting's being recorded as well. Uh, we have a project survey that was mentioned. And again, two public meetings. Uh, so there'll be some opportunity uh, to weigh in on the project. Okay, let's jump to uh, Ravine Drive. So that was pretty much that was pretty much our scope task. So what you're looking at now, uh, we're going to talk about uh, Ravine Drive uh, and Kakwa. So basically, I'm going to come up here. Uh, what you see here in the gray, that's existing Ravine Drive today. Okay. What you see in the yellow is the proposed ravine drive. So it's going to be shifted west. Uh, what you're looking at here is a top-down view. Okay, you're looking from above here. You see the Cockwa Bridge, proposed Cockwa Bridge. And then what you're looking at down here uh, is a typical section. That's a slice, a slice of the roadway. The yellow represents the travel lanes, and the orange represents the shoulders. Okay, so that's what we're looking at here. Again, we have, a, uh, we have a nice poster board that uh, you're free to come look at after. Just a few facts here about Ravine. The speed is 15 miles per hour, so what we're proposing are two 11-foot lanes and five-foot shoulders on each side. Again, uh, yellow is the 11, and the five-foot is the uh, orange, the shoulder. That's the area adjacent to the travel lane. So out there today, what's there today? two 12-foot lanes and a one-and-a-half-foot shoulder on each side. So there'll be some significant improvements there. Uh, part of that is uh, it, it'll make it more accessible for um, pedestrians and cyclists. There will be shared lane markings on the road for cyclists. Uh, and then the, the minimal vertical clearance that we need to meet per design criteria is 14 and a half feet. And I'll talk about uh, vertical clearances in just a moment. And then this also meets uh, PennDOT design criteria, okay, especially for sight distance and horizontal curvature. Okay, so that's an improvement uh, we're implementing here, Ravine Drive. Now, talking about Kakwa, uh, as you see above Ravine Drive there, the speed on Kakwa is 25 miles per hour. What we're proposing is two 12-foot lanes and six-foot sidewalks each side. What's out there today? Two 12-foot lanes and five-foot sidewalks. Okay, so we're looking to expand those sidewalks. Um, again, Cockwell's going to meet uh, PennDOT design criteria. Cockwell will have shared lane markings as well. And um, there will be ADA ramps at both intersections at Superior and Crescent. 
And some of those details we'll dig into, you know, once we get a little further into design. Okay? And that's our, our 30% submission, um, Ravine Drive. I think I covered everything. A couple other things here, just while I'm remembering here. Again, Port Authority property. These uh, dash lines you see are what we call cut and fill lines. That's just the difference of, of where the earthwork is today versus where it's going to be with the uh, uh, shifted roadway. Okay, so let's move on to the alternatives, why we're all here today, right? Okay, so we do have three alternatives to show you. We've got poster boards. We're going to dig into all three of them here. Um, and the first one is a multi-girder structure. I have these. So what you see on the poster boards, we're going to see on the screen uh, momentarily. Um, what you're looking at on the right-hand side is a typical section. Again, that's a slice uh, of the bridge. So the first alternative is a multi-girder structure. The bridge cost, and these are um, approximate uh, costs at this time because we're, we're not deep into the design, so there is a level of uh, contingency placed on these costs. Bridge cost is about $1.5 million. Total construction cost, that's going to be some of the costs associated with ravine, the shift of ravine, some of the earthwork, some of the drainage. Uh, comes to approximately about $2 million for alternative number one. And that's the far board. Alternative number two, we call that a conspan arch. It, it, it closely resembles what was once there. So the bridge cost for that is about 1.9 million. Um, and then the total construction cost is about two and a half. Um, that includes a little additional um, fill material um, for the conspan arch, uh, wing walls as well that are a little uh, longer. So that's alternative number two. Alternative number three, we call it an open spandrel arch. The bridge cost there is about $2.6 million. Very similar to the first alternative, but we introduced that, uh, that arch in the middle. Um, and then the total construction cost there is about $3.1 million. Okay, so let's take a look at alternative number one. Okay, this is the multi-girder structure. And again, the perspective here is looking north uh, on Ravine Drive. So the vertical clearance is pretty good compared to what's there today. 23 and a half feet of vertical clearance. It's about uh, approximately 125 foot uh, span over Ravine Drive. Uh, there are integral abutments and this could be either uh, pre-stressed concrete beams or steel beams. Um, and you can see the beam, uh, there's, there's quite a depth on those beams um, to support the structure. You see the sharrows there as well, um, but that would be your perspective um, from uh, Ravine Drive. Now let's look at a perspective from Kakwa. Same alternative. And this is up above. So what you're looking at, the two 12-foot travel lanes, then you're looking at a uh, what we call a type 10 barrier. So because of that height from Kakwa to Ravine, we need to protect vehicles, and um, we need to do that with some sort of crash-worthy barrier. So that's what you see um, near the shoulder area. You see that concrete with the, uh, um, with, with the barrier there. Sidewalk and then railing. Railing would protect, protect the pedestrians. Now there is some, we have a little bit of room here to work with, uh, and I'll show you with one of the, the later alternatives, but uh, once we get into the bridge, um, what bridge alternative we're going to go with, then we can um, modify this slightly, but we're still going to need the crash-worthy uh, barrier. Okay, so let's go to number two, alternative number two. Okay, 
So this is that conspan arch. So the vertical clearance at the center, that would be the double yellow lines there, is about 22 and a half feet. Okay. And then the 19 feet would be at, uh, at the shoulder area, just because of the, the shape of the arch. So still meets a vertical clearance. Um, we're looking at a 60-foot length uh, barrel. I, again, I, I believe the existing was about 57. Um, now, there could be some precast elements there, meaning in the factory they could make, probably make that arch, deliver it on site. Um, the wing walls, as you see, would have to be uh, cast in place. When I say wing walls, I'm referring to these right here on both sides. Okay, the arches in the middle, that would be uh, precast, brought to the site, more than likely. Now let's take a look up above uh, the perspective from uh, Kakwa up above. And again, because this is more like a, it's an arch, so there's going to be, the road's going to be on fill, so not necessarily like uh, alternatives number one and three. Um, so you're going to have guide rail. That's going to be the protection for vehicular, um, for cars. You've got the sidewalk, um, and then again, you have the guide rail there. Okay. Okay, let's jump to uh, alternative number three. This is the open spandrel arch. A looking north on Ravine Drive. Uh, so what kind of vertical clearance we have here? We have a 21 and a half foot vertical clearance. That's at the center. Again, the double yellow line. And then we have about a 20... Uh, what's that, 20.5 vertical clearance at the shoulder areas. Okay. So now this one, again, this one is a little more expensive. You have some additional uh, structural work there. Where, where that arch sits, you have some, uh, um, you know, abutments there, and you'll have to have some deep foundations to support those as well. And again, this could be um, a reinforced concrete. This could be steel as well. You know, a, a slight uh, price difference, nothing significant. But we know as prices are fluctuating right now, you know, things could, could fluctuate there as far as the pricing. Um, there would be more foundation excavation and... Um, Let's look at, now this is a different alternative than I showed you in one, even though the bridges are, um, they're both on bridge. So this one, we would have a barrier, um, if you see that pedestrian walking, kind of at the edge of the sidewalk. Again, that's to protect the vehicles. That's the crash-worthy uh, barrier. So as you see, we could have a couple different options with one of these structures on what's up above. But we do need to have that crash-worthy uh, barrier. Okay. So uh, lighting, oh, let me go back here. So we know there's lighting on each side, right? One on uh, Crescent and Superior. We're going to get into that in our design, some lighting analysis to determine um, if we need to relocate those, if we need to add additional uh, lighting poles. But the goal would be to light the roadway and the uh, sidewalk. And then we also know there's two lighting pools down below on Ravine. So again, we'll do a lighting analysis down there, make sure it's well lit in the area of the bridge to determine how many pools um, we need. Uh, two is probably sufficient, but again, we're gonna go through that lighting analysis for the lighting. Um, we know there are some mature trees too when we talk about Ravine. And right now it looks like we're only gonna impact maybe a couple of those uh, mature trees with the shift in Ravine. Uh, that's something we know it's very important to uh, a lot of you folks here, so we're going to do our best to try to minimize any impacts to some of that landscape and those mature trees. Um, should any be impacted, obviously we'll do what we can to get those into contract, some additional trees. But uh, we know that's important, and uh, I just wanted to point that out. Okay, so what's our schedule look like? So we're going to be doing our engineering work, right? 
you see structure plans, you see roadway submission. We're going to be doing that in the next several months. And then we get into public meeting number two. Uh, that's an estimated time frame, probably sometime around uh, October, where we can come back and we can look a little further at some of those details, whether it's the lighting, the, the crash-worthy barriers, uh, and then the traffic control. Final bid package near the end of this year. Again, that's where we get the plans and specs, everything put together uh, to get it out to uh, bidding, which would go out to uh, um, different contractors. And uh, so I did put a note here, pending construction funding availability. Those are the best dates right now. But again, it, it is pending uh, funding availability, the bidding and construction. And then what's a construction duration? This should be approximately a, a three to five month uh, project. That doesn't mean Ravine's gonna be closed that period of time. Again, we know how important that is. So it's gonna remain open, maybe with some temporary closures, but again, until we get the structure type, um, we'll be able to talk more on that. So on that, I just have my contact information up here. So. Uh, you're free to contact me. Again, comment forms. And I believe at this time, Chris, we're going to go to make our way to public comment. Okay. So I'll let you direct the... Thank you, Brian. If you have any comments, just start over to my left, and then we'll take one at a time up the podium. Two minutes, please. Okay. Let me just move some of the accoutrements off of here for you. Oh, good evening. Um, my name is Jay Shimmick. I live on Lincoln Avenue, uh, and I've been there for 32 years. And uh, I used to live in the house that my grandmother bought in 1957. So like most of you, I'm a neighbor. Um, I'm certainly very grateful to the mayor and his staff when they listen to the public outcry about the uh, proposed emergency road that was going to scar Ravine uh, Park and they canceled that project. And so I'm hoping now that when they do this project, they listen to the neighbors. And one of the concerns that I have is Sixth and Maryland. They put in the four-way stop so that the neighborhood traffic could get onto Sixth Street, which they used to do across the bridge to Kakwa, and they couldn't. I'm sure that four-way stop has been a godsend to the neighbors, especially the folks at St. Joseph's to access West 8th Street and those beautiful streetscape improvements that serve all the businesses there. <clears throat> so if they're thinking about doing away with that four-way stop as part of reopening Kakwa, I hope that they will listen to the neighbors about that four-way stop because it was certainly jolting at first when you came and saw that as a, as a driver. But I think the traffic, uh, the uh, drivers have gotten used to it. Uh, so. I, I just hope you listen to the neighbors on that. Um, I think the, the drawings are a little bit misleading in that in the 50 or so plus years I've been going across that bridge, I don't think I've ever seen three vehicles on it at the same time. <laughs> and so because of that, I don't think you need that barrier in alternative one. Uh, the, for 100 years, it was a, you know, two lanes and two concrete sidewalks. And I don't know that you need that barrier that's why the, the, the top of number three seems to be better to me where the, the barrier goes along uh, um, there. <clears throat> My comments are, uh, number two, the wing wall is very nostalgic, but that's going to be a canvas for any kid with a can of spray paint. And plus, the reason the bridge failed was the water behind those wing walls. <clears throat> number three, with the spandrel, I'm sure the neighborhood kids will be climbing on the spandrels and I don't like that. But to me, more important than anything is any money that isn't spent on this bridge can be spent elsewhere in the city. And so that's why I am for number one. Anybody else? Okay. That was fast. Any other comments? 
Um, come on around. Ma'am, the online audience can't hear you, so you need to come to the microphone. It's just really a question. I'm wondering if all... Julie Leonard, 118 Columbia Circle. I'm just wondering if all three bridges have the same life expectancy or what is the life expectancy, what is the problem of repair of the bridges versus the road. Big price difference, so I'm just wondering how you could comment on that. Hi, uh, Danny Yunus. I live at 311 Crescent. Um, I was just curious if there's a way to incorporate uh, any sort of like greenery, like the hanging flower beds or maybe like, uh, I don't know, some kind of flower bed or something just to make it more appealing. Uh, just looks like it could be more well integrated into the landscape maybe. Thank you. Brian, do you want to take the questions or? Yeah, yeah. Let me uh, no, cover this. There's another question. One more question. Come on up. I don't really like coming up here. But um, Katie Razor, 7 Ferncliff Beach. Um, when that survey went out, I know that I got the letter and responded. I was one of the ones that said no bridge. But was that a, to all of Erie, or is that just the concentrated area of us living in this neighborhood? Because, you know, it just brings up the whole viaduct thing for me, and it just, like, rubs me the wrong way, this whole totally unnecessary bridge going up for the sake of... So I'm curious about that. Okay. Come on. Hello. My name is Mike Argeny, and I'm the dock master for the Erie Yacht Club. And uh, as Mr. Shimmick uh, pointed out, a lot of the details about the three different bridges um, from firsthand uh, maintenance aspect, um, uh, Erie Yacht Club has to um, uh, take care of a lot of Ravine Drive uh, in cooperation with the Port Authority. And I know that <clears throat> option number two presented a lot of problems based on its design, the archway, the wing walls, um, the water that couldn't escape drainage problems, sunlight problems, not reaching Ravine Drive, um, and also access for Erie Yacht Club, um, uh, deliveries, um, boat transportation, uh, and also, you know, th this plan here is uh, great to straighten the road as it goes through the tunnel or bridge, uh, but still with this arch, I'm just concerned that it would still present like a blind curve of some sort, uh, and I know that over the past hundred years, Erie Yacht Club hasn't gotten any smaller. Um, you know, we're currently expanding. I just, I just see that there's going to be, um, you know, no less traffic traveling Ravine Drive, and I, I think that the clearance is key, um, al along with, um, you know, making maintenance a little bit uh, more automatic. You know, let the area kind of maintain itself by allowing drainage to happen naturally. Um, snow plowing concerns. Um, less salt to be used if sunlight can reach the road, um, you know, and just just keeping the idea of maintenance in mind. Thank you. Any other comments about our plans? 
Ryan, you want to take it? Yeah. Oh, we have one more here, Chris. <laughs> I think they're waiting until you leave, but then they. It's all good. My name is David Grab. I live at 503 Cockwood Boulevard. When I look at these proposals, I think they're really nice. It's a great improvement for the area. But could we have gotten anything that looked more in place in the woods? Meaning maybe a, a wooden structure that would be supported over the, the uh, steel beams or something? That it doesn't look like it's just out of um, the highway. I know it's a PennDOT uh, proposal and situation, but I would think that we could make it look more attractive and blend in more for Ravine Drive. The other thing that I have a question about or a concern about is we're going to straighten that road, we're going to do this part of the yellow, but we're not going to be doing anything before coming down to the bridge and after the bridge. And what's my concern is what's going to happen to the rest of the road? And is there an opportunity or a proposal that we can finish the road under this type of a program where it gets widened, it gets five feet on either side, it gets its proper drainage, and it becomes an access road for everyone in Ferncliff as well as for people to enjoy the publicness of the Erie Yacht Club. I'll wait longer this time. All right, excellent comments, appreciate them. Brian will start. Take what you can, and if not, our team can help on a few. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And great comments and questions from everybody. We appreciate it. That's why we're here. So uh, going through uh, the comments, and I have my team here who's uh, I'm going to queue up on uh, potentially um, a couple of these. One question dealt with uh, the first one um, talked about uh, what alternative um, that was favored. Um, and then about all, so yeah, that's a detail. When we look at alternative number three, the top picture, I mean, yeah, that's a detail that if, if we do select, if alternate number one is selected or three, um, that top picture could could take place there. I mean, that, that's why we showed it. So that's definitely an option. And again, we're going to work into those design details. Um, so that is an option. You mentioned water behind the wing walls. Um, I, I know that the proper drainage for alternate number two, the proper drainage will, will be in place to uh, collect that water into a piping system. Uh, I know that's not necessarily exactly there today. Um, so, so the proper drainage will be installed. That, that was a comment on a, on a, on a few uh, folks about the, the water backing up, and that is a problem today. But uh, again, that was built in 1920. So there will be proper uh, drainage and piping to carry the water um, to, to, the, to the system. Life expectancy? Yeah. For all three, right? So all three, about 75 to 100 years. So it gives you a pretty good lifespan um, for all three of those. Give or take a couple years on there, but mostly 75 to 100. Um, yeah, incorporating Greenway, that's something we'll look into. That's a detail that uh, we'll definitely take that comment, look into that. Um, I'm looking through some of the other ones. Some of the maintenance uh, issues. Um, and we could talk to the city about, uh, there were a couple suggestions there about, um, you know, a wooden structure and an access road. You know, those are conversations we, we can see that if it's within our, you know, scope and, the, uh, you know, cost effective, but uh, we can have a conversation on that at least. Um, I... Did I catch them all, Chris? Yes, sounds good. Okay. Leanne, do you want to address the stop sign? Or... Oh, yeah. That's... You want to hold on there? Okay. And, and we'll look into that stop sign one as well. Right. Jason, go ahead. Hello. So um, I can address the survey question that, that uh, came up. So the, uh, the neighborhood pole, um, the limits of that were South Shore, South Shore Drive to West 6th Street and then uh, Maryland to Lincoln. And it was approximately 330 surveys. 
And then um, the other question that came up about the, the Port Authority, uh, or I'm sorry, about Ravine Drive, um, you know, the limits there would be the minimum necessary to do the bridge work. Um, as far as the rest of the, the Ravine Drive, that's, uh, as we said earlier, that's Port Authority owned. So that's something that would have to be uh, a discussion outside of this project. And it's not even city right away, so. Okay, thank you. We're good. All right, so do you want to do you want to come up with one follow up uh, on the project? With regard to the first gentleman that spoke, the last word that he said uh, was, your name and, your name and my name is Richard, the last name is Sukic, uh, and I live at 226 Madison. He ended his comments talking, he said access. And, and access is an important word to me because access would have gone and affected my property back in March of 20. So when you say access, if you're talking about access as already, <laughs> if you're talking about access as as being Ravine Drive, yes. But if there's a possibility of access other than Ravine Drive, in, which came up before, then I think additional hearings are in order. Some discussion is in order. You know, but. My property was going, to, it's selfish, I guess, but my property was going to be affected. I was never, ever contacted by anybody in the city or involved in this project to say, you know, you may use, lose the corner of your property. Never. That was, that's the first thing. The second gentleman said that there were 300 surveys. If you would just clarify, were there 300 surveys sent out and how many surveys were received? 55% of 300 surveys versus 55% of 100 surveys that were sent out is quite a difference. So I, I've been asking that question since this first happened. How many surveys? I mean, the survey number can be argued, but the respondents, how many people responded to the survey? So, all right, thank you very much. Do we have a total on the surveys back? You have it? Okay. So to an answer that question, it was, it was 330 surveys, and we had um, 208 was the response rate on that. And then we already gave the percentages earlier, 55, 38, and 7. All right. Anything else? Once, twice, thank you. And um, again, we'll be sticking around for a little while longer. Really appreciate you coming out, giving us your comments, um, fill out the surveys, and uh, when, we pick a, when we pick a bridge, we will have one more public, uh, public hearing on this, um, probably in the fall if the timing stays as it is now. So thank you very much, have a great night.